Hello, everybody. Laszlo Montgomery here once again with another cookie from the jar of Chinese history. My apologies, my sincere apologies for taking two weeks to get another podcast uploaded. It's been sort of a crazy time here. Um, We're going to be starting a series of shows on the early dynasties right after Labor Day. But today we're going to look at Mr. Li Ka-shing, the wealthiest Chinese in the world. He's also the third richest person in Asia behind two of India's richest moguls. That's uh, Mukesh Ambani of the Reliance Group, weighing in at $29 billion, and the steel baron Lakshmi Matal, a tad behind Mr. Ambani with $28.7 billion. At $21 billion, Li ka hasn't done too bad for himself, so he'd be the third richest person in Asia and the 14th richest worldwide, and these figures are based on the Forbes Magazine 2010 list. Now, although this is a history podcast, Big Lee, or Superman as he's called in the Hong Kong press, has been around for a long time and has played such a big role in China, particularly in southern China, using the influence of his money and his sterling reputation to advance a lot of good things in China, and certainly with regard to China and Hong Kong. He's given away over a billion and a half dollars of his own wealth through his Li ka Foundation. In examining the life of Li Ka-shing, we can study a textbook example of someone who came from China and started a new life somewhere, made a fortune, and never forgot where he came from. He's revered in Asia and around the world by those who know of him as a guy who came from nothing and left his home in China at a very difficult time in the country's history, and with nothing except the sweat of his own brow and his own wits, became perhaps the greatest business tycoon in modern Chinese history. And from time to time, we'll look at some of these tycoons and examine their impact on history and Chinese society. There have been some real colorful business tycoons in the past century. Yu Tong San, Tang Xiu Qin, Yip Han, Y.K. Pao, Run Run Shaw, Stanley Ho, and Henry Falk, to name a few. They all made a lot, and they all gave a lot back. I lived in Hong Kong nine years, and you couldn't go anywhere by foot, by bus, taxi, MTR, KCR, without seeing the generosity of all these billionaires. Hospitals, schools, sanitariums, colleges, universities, playgrounds, gardens, and libraries, all bearing the name of one of these tycoons or another. So today we look at Li ka perhaps the greatest of them all. Li was a Chaozhou Ren born in the Phoenix city of Chaozhou on June 13, 1928, right at the end of China's warlord era. A lot of stuff you buy in Walmart and all these discount retailers come from this city. It's famous for their ceramics, their style of food, gong fu tea, and very rich culture. The Chaozhou dialect is really something else, totally unintelligible from Cantonese and most Cantonese dialects. In Mandarin, his name is pronounced Li Jia Cheng. China in 1940 was in total chaos, with the Japanese invading and an undeclared civil war raging. Li's family left their native land for Hong Kong when he was 12. His father died of TB a few years later, and Li had to drop out of school and entered La Vida at the age of 15 to go out and support his family. He ended up working at a plastics trading company. The timing was perfect as plastics was just starting to find all kinds of interesting applications in consumer products. He started his own plastics factory in 1950. He called it Chang Industries. Chang is Cantonese for Changjiang. This means long river. The Changjiang is the second longest river in the world, which many people know as the Yangtze. Li ka named his company after this great river that was so much a part of China's history and bisected the country into North and South China. Li saw the market for manufactured consumer products was on a very steep trajectory upwards. He knew it wasn't enough to be a middleman. You had to control the manufacturing. He became a major supplier of plastic flowers to Western markets in addition to other markets locally and in Asia. By 1958, he moved into his own property that he developed himself. He had been renting factory space up until then. And then came 1967, the year that changed everything. Li ka was 39 when this tumultuous year went down. The Cultural Revolution was raging in China, and it was just a complete mess up there. 
We'll examine this in another podcast, but suffice to say, everything stopped in China and all people were doing was protesting, making revolution, attacking their enemies, turning on each other, and constantly railing against the West. The 1967 riots, or Liu Qi Bao Dong, was a crazy time in Hong Kong, and anyone who was alive at the time and cognizant of what was happening has many stories to tell about how they weathered this storm. Bombs were going off in the streets, and there were strikes, and there was a mass exodus out of Hong Kong, and this, of course, caused the property market to tank. The fear was that China was out to snatch Hong Kong away from Britain. As I mentioned in a previous podcast on the Opium War, China never recognized the treaty that ceded Hong Kong to Britain. So the sentiment was they were going to invade and wreak havoc on the colony and just destroy it. Li Ka-shing wasn't as connected back then like he is now, but he knew this madness was only temporary, and the best and smartest thing to do was ride out the storm in Hong Kong. He sent his family to Singapore, and he stayed behind and continued to run his plastic flowers manufacturing business. He saw what was happening to property values when everyone started dumping their flats and Developers tried to get rid of land and unfinished projects. By 1967, Lee was a successful manufacturer and well-established with cash in the bank. He took all his money, and as everyone was clamoring for flights out of Kai Tak Airport for other destinations, Lee ka Shing bought up as much property as he could without borrowing any money from banks. Lee ka Shing knew in his heart what a lot of people know. China needed Hong Kong. China in 1967 wasn't the China of the 21st century that we all know today. China was poor and still pretty much closed to the West. Hong Kong was China's one reliable and lucrative window to the West. Hong Kong wasn't sitting on pools of oil or gold or other natural resources. Hong Kong's greatest natural resource were the Hong Kong Yen, the people of Hong Kong, and their work ethic and ability to survive and even thrive in the face of adversity. So he took what many believed to be a big gamble at the time. And when everything quieted down and property prices started recovering, his gamble paid off and gave him the financial wherewithal to build an empire on this foundation he had built with his own hard work and business acumen. Now that he had amassed a substantial amount of property, he set up a new company, also called Chang Gong, and this company has been Li ka Shing's flagship enterprise and remains so to this day. According to their website, the Chang Gong Group today operates in 54 countries and employs almost a quarter million staff worldwide. The company's business is, of course, real estate investment, which mainly includes developing properties. The Hong Kong government will, from time to time, raise revenue by holding auctions to sell various tracts of land in and around Hong Kong. Sometimes they just take a bunch of dirt and just fill in the gaps along the coast to reclaim land out of what was formerly Hong Kong Harbor, for example. And after the land is ready, all the biggest of the big tycoons bid for the property. They build residential flats or office buildings or shopping malls, or in some cases build these mega-projects incorporating residential, office, hotels, and commercial, including retail. And then they sell and lease out these units to the public and make profits like you cannot imagine. This is what Li ka Shing has been doing for over 40 years. Today, about 15% of Hong Kong residents go to sleep every night in a flat in a building that was developed by Chang Gong. Chang Gong was reorganized into what is known today as Chang Gong Holdings Limited. This is not only the listed name of the company on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, it's also the investment vehicle that Li ka Shing uses to buy other companies, the most famous of which is the old British trading company founded in 1863, known today as Hutchison Wampoa Limited, and the other being the Hong Kong Electric Company. The Hong Kong Electric Company runs the electric utility on Hong Kong and Lama Islands. The firm has been around since 1890. I was a customer for many years of Hong Kong Electric and therefore can say I played a small role in Mr. Lee's vast accumulation of wealth. I always paid my electric bill on time, Mr. Lee. In September 1979, Lee ka Shing bought Hutchison Wampoa from Hong Kong Bank, who owned a 22% stake in the firm at the time. It created quite a lot of stir and controversy to the entrenched British interests at the time. Li ka Shing paid 639 million Hong Kong dollars, which is about 82 million in today's U.S. dollars. 
This was the first time that such a venerable old British trading company ended up being controlled by a Chinese. Definitely was a sign of the times and a harbinger of things to come. Hutchison is an international conglomerate in every sense of the word. In Hong Kong, they own Watson's, which is the Walgreens, CVS, and Rite Aid of Southeast Asia, especially in the Chinese-speaking regions. They also own Park and Shop, the Safeway or Kroger of Hong Kong. They also own many other retail concerns around the world. Watson's and Park and Shop are the most famous. They also have a huge portfolio of property, including some of the most prestigious buildings in the markets they invest. There is an entire energy and infrastructure arm of Hutchison that includes Husky Oil in Canada. Hutchison was one of the pioneers in mobile phone networks, and they own networks everywhere and are a giant in the world telecommunications industry. But perhaps their biggest business of all is their investment in ports all around the world. They own HIT, Hong Kong International Terminals Limited, which I think is still the busiest and largest independent operator in the world. They own, among many others, the port of Felixstowe in London. In fact, they're in 50 ports around the world. They acquire them, or they build them, and they make incredible profits uh, uh, managing and operating them. According to their website, they operate a total of 306 berths in the 50 ports they operate. That's 306 big container vessels loading and unloading their cargo every day, getting those Barbie dolls, KD furniture, housewares, cosmetics, luggage, hardware, everything you buy and everything that's a chemical or component of what you buy and consume every day. In fact, 12% of all the port traffic in the world passes through this company. Hutchison's profit in 2008 was $2.265 billion on $44.66 billion in revenue. That's in U.S. dollars. Not bad for an $82 million investment. As I mentioned at the outset, Li ka Shing came from Chaozhou in southern Guangdong province. He has poured hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into every conceivable kind of charity and project in his hometown and throughout China. When natural disasters hit, massive donations are given in his name by his companies. He has pledged about 10 billion U.S. dollars to charities. Like Bill Gates, he has his own foundation doing good works everywhere. You'd really have to dig hard to find anything negative about the quality and the sincerity of Li ka generosity. And he lives in a huge mansion in Deepwater Bay, which is sort of the Bel Air or Holmby Hills of Hong Kong. But he never lost his humility and supposedly still wears a cheap watch he's had forever. And you won't see him wearing John Lobb shoes either. Not a flashy guy by any means. He's respected for what he is humble origins, lived during upheaval, worked hard, saved, invested wisely, and amassed a fortune and never forgot where he came from. For all the years I have known of Li ka Shing, he's always had a very positive image. But you can't be this high profile and not have your detractors. If you're someone who supports democracy and direct elections in Hong Kong, you may not be so keen on his very cozy relations with the China government. He is very close to the highest layers of power in Beijing. He's not a big supporter of democracy in Hong Kong, or in China for that matter. He's not outspoken on this, but he's no advocate either. He needs these important relationships for the sake of his company's continued growth and prosperity so he can't upset China's leaders. And because of the many relationships he has with so many China private and state-owned companies, his name gets mixed in with a lot of dubious businesses like weapons and high-tech transfer. As you could tell, I always admired the guy, but there are plenty out there who might beg to differ. Li ka is still alive and kicking. He turned 82 years old this past June. Go check out his Facebook page. That's all I have for you today. This one was just a quickie about someone you might question as to why he belongs in a podcast about Chinese history. The history books one day will definitely include Li ka -shing. No matter what anyone thinks of the man, you can't say he didn't play a big role as one of the many jet engines that helped China grow as fast and as spectacularly as China did in the 80s, 90s, and into the century. Be watching for the first in a series of podcasts where I'll give a general overview of China's dynasties. I'll probably get the first one uploaded next week. We'll start at the very beginning with the first Chinese dynasty, the legendary Xia dynasty. So this is Laszlo Montgomery, happy once again to be back home in wonderful Claremont, California after being on the road for the past week with my China colleagues. 
please feel free to visit my website at chinahistorypodcast.com. You're welcome to email me with any questions, comments, or suggestions for topics. Thanks, and take care, everyone.